Hello, everyone. Welcome to the SLC webinar, New Tech Transfer Regulations, What You Need to Know. My name is Courtney Silverthorne. I'm the Deputy Director of the Technology Partnerships Office at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So today we have about 25 minutes of slides and then plenty of time for questions. During the presentation, you can submit questions using your chat box on the left side of the screen, and we'll be reading and answering those questions at the end. You can also use the chat box if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar. There's also a resource box on the right side of your screen that contains the final bindal and personnel exchange rule, as well as some of the other resources that I'll be pointing out throughout the presentation. So to set the stage for what we'll be talking about today, uh, the why, the when, and the what, um, we'll go over some of the background of the Lab to Market Initiative briefly to tell you uh, why we undertook these changes to the regulation. Um, we'll go over a little bit of the timeline and implementation to give you a flavor of how long it took to put this into place and, and important dates to know about. And then we'll actually dive into the what of changes that you need to know about as a tech transfer professional. So we'll start with the why, some background on the Lab to Market initiative that sets the stage for how we got here. So as many of you are already aware, the Presidential Memorandum on Technology Transfer in 2011 really kicked off all these lab to market activity. Uh, the lab to market initiative was formalized as a cross-agency priority goal in 2014 and will actually continue on as a second cross-agency priority goal as announced in the President's Management Agenda on March 20th. Subsequent to the first cross-agency priority goal, uh, a National Science and Technology Council subcommittee was chartered under the Committee on Technology, and this will be rechartered as the Lab to Market subcommittee under the newly formed Committee on Science and Technology Enterprise. So this will house uh, efforts not only related to technology transfer, but also on uh, scientific collections, on research infrastructure, and on open data initiatives. The original CAP goal had five sub-goals, developing human capital, which were programs that encouraged entrepreneurship at federal agencies, as well as the foundations of the NIST partnership with the Minority Business Development Administration to encourage uh, minority participation in federal tech transfer and in SBIR programs. Empowering effective collaboration, which focused on tech transfer authorities and best practices, Opening R&D assets, which is probably the most visible of the five sub-goals because this was the sub-goal that led to the development of FLC Business 2.0. Fueling small business innovation, which was led by SBA to improve the SBIR program. And evaluating impact, which focused on both tech transfer metrics as well as impact analysis of federal technology transfer. So the regulatory activities that took place under Lab to Market, both on BIDOL and also on personnel exchanges, which I'll mention on the next slide, were both housed under the Empowering Effective Collaboration sub-goal that focused on these and best practices. So while we'll mostly be focusing on the updates to the BIDOL regulation here today, there were actually two regulatory activities that took place under this uh, Empowering Effective Collaboration sub-goal. The first uh, was issued at the end of 2016 for personnel exchanges, and this was a goal to develop regulations to establish new and expanded mechanisms for the exchange of federal personnel to nonprofit and for-profit entities. So while it's really easy for federal personnel to be exchanged out to, say, a university or to a state or local government organization, it's been a little bit more challenging for agencies to send and receive personnel to and from private entities. Um, so this regulation uh, created some clarifications with the CRADA statute that made personal exchanges a little bit easier for agencies. These regulations can be found at 15 CFR 17. There's a link over on your sidebar, um, and there'll be a link at the end of the presentation as well. And then we really focused on the BIDOL Act after that, um, updating the BIDOL Act to improve extramural funding partnerships, to increase compliance by recipients of extramural funding, and improve agency access to data reported by extramural funding recipients. 
The data access was primarily through changes in the iEdison system, and the uh, funding partnerships and compliance we took uh, through the regulatory path. While there are a number of changes in the final BIDL regulation that published in April, when we set out on this journey, we had a couple of main goals. The first was that the 2011 America Invents Act created some timelines, definitions, and royalty payment requirements that were in conflict with provisions in the current regulation. We also identified certain scenarios, such as provisional applications, joint IP developed between a funding recipient and a federal laboratory employee, and create a background licenses that were not contemplated or adequately addressed in the original BIDL Act. We also decided to codify Executive Order 12591, which expanded the applicability of the BIDL Act to businesses of all sizes in the regulation. Previously, it had been only applied to small businesses in addition to nonprofits. And it turned out that as we went through the process, we discovered we numbered some of the sections of the original regulation wrong. And so we worked with the Office of the Federal Register to renumber those in a way that was as least disruptive as possible. We identified additional goals and uh, necessities in the update process as we went through the various stages of legal revision, uh, agency review, and through our public comment process as well. So next we'll turn to the timeline and implementation. This was a lot of work behind the scenes at NIST and was an incredibly eye-opening process for me. So the very first email that I could find uh, identifying BIDOL as a regulatory priority under the Lab to Market Initiative was dated November 15, 2015. Um, right at the end of 2015, NIST began the drafting process with assistance from our legal group as well as the interagency working group for BIDOL. It took us until July of 2016 to clear a draft through uh, the working group and through NIST and send it over to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, uh, or OIRA, to start the uh, agency comment process. Um, the agency comment process completed in uh, October 2016 and was finally cleared for publication in the Federal Register as a notice of proposed rulemaking. This was published on November 7, 2016 and had a 60-day comment period. And as part of that public comment process, we also held a public meeting and a webinar at NIST with about 35 attendees total. And so that pretty much took us up to the end of the first year of our timeline. Kicking off the second year of our timeline, uh, our public comment period closed on December 9th of 2016. We received 17 public comments through that period. And the regulations.gov docket information and the link to the first publication of the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking are also in your sidebar links in the resources section and also at the end of this presentation. By March of 2017, uh, the rule had been revised at NIST, again with assistance from our legal group and the BIDL working group. We received and addressed comments from Maine Department of Commerce by August of 2017. And in September of 2017, OMB required us to revise the preamble language to include cost savings information as required by the new Executive Order 13771. We finally cleared the rule through the Department of Commerce in October of 2017 and set an off for a second round of agency review through the LRM process. By March of 2018, we had completed the final, final revision and published the rule on April 13, 2018, 881 days from start to finish. The important thing to note here is that while the effective date of the rule is 30 days after publication, or May 13, 2018, the rule is only applicable to new funding agreements that are executed after the effective date or existing funding agreements that are modified at an agency's discretion to include the new rule applicability. So you'll want to check with your contracts or grants group to check whether uh, a particular invention is coming in under the old rule or the new rule. So now let's move on to the main topic the changes to the vital rule that will affect federal tech transfer offices. 
I'll note here that these changes are applicable to all agencies. I've identified five major changes that you should know about as a federal tech transfer professional. And then I'll also point out some of the more general changes that are pertinent to the extramural community, but might be interesting for you to be aware of as well. So the first change is a new determination of exceptional circumstances, or a DEC, in 401.3. In my past life, uh, I worked for a contractor that had a DEC, and it took me forever to realize that DEC was an abbreviation and not a DEC, D-E-C-K. For those of you who don't already know, a DEC is a determination that allows an agency to restrict or limit a contractor's vital rights due to the exceptional nature of the work that they're doing. So there are already DECs in place in the BIDL regulations that allow for an agency to withhold normal BIDL rights for situations like foreign recipients of federal funding, uh, contractors who work on nuclear programs, and contractors who work on behalf of the government under a cooperative research and development agreement. So this change here in 401.3 is to add a new DEC, which states, if the contract provides for services, and the contractor is not a nonprofit organization and does not promote the commercialization and public availability of subject inventions pursuant to 35 U.S.C. 200. So what this is saying is that uh, there are sometimes service-based support contractors who may occasionally have or contribute to a subject invention, but on the whole, the service-based support contractor does not engage in commercialization activities that would ultimately advance an invention to the marketplace. Under the standard by dole terms, these service-based support contractors would still have the full two-year period to decline to elect rights to an invention before that title would wave back to the funding agency. Under this DEC, the funding agency can determine upfront that the service-based support contractor would not be able to commercialize any inventions and then take title to inventions that happen to occur and manage them in accordance with that agency's mission and needs. The second issue I wanted to address is a priority order for co-inventions found in 401.10. I've used some stick figures to illustrate the scenarios here because it can be a little complicated to follow along, and you'll note that this is why I was not an art major in college. So the typical scenario contemplated by Bayh-Dole is the figure on the left. A funding agency provides a contract or a grant to an extramural researcher, perhaps at a university, and that university researcher and his or her team work on a project, they invent something, and the Vital Act states that the university researcher, or rather his or her employer, retain ownership of that invention. If they choose not to elect title to the invention, it reverts back to the funding agency, and everything is clean and simple. However, sometimes reality is not always so clean and simple, and sometimes we have the scenario on the right-hand side instead. A funding agency provides a contract or a grant to our university researcher, but now he or she needs some help from a different federal lab in order to carry out the work. So, for example, maybe NIH gives a grant to our university researcher, and he comes to work at NIST at one of our user facilities and collaborates with one of our, say, nanotechnology experts. And that NIST employee and the university employee jointly create an invention. There wasn't really a good understanding in the Vital Regulation of how to handle this type of co-invention, particularly after the extramural funding recipient waived title to the invention. An explicit reading of Vital would say that it reverted back to the funding agency like any other invention. But this failed to address the fact that another agency also had interest in the invention through their co-inventor. So what we've done here in 401.10 is created an explicit order of operations for how to handle these joint inventions between uh, extramural funding recipients and federal lab researchers. So obviously, because this is the BIDOL regulation, the contractor has the first right to elect title because it's the BIDOL regulation. Where we went next was if a contractor waives that first right, uh, the inventing agency will have second right to elect title. And the reason we took this stance was because the Constitution grants uh, inventors ownership of their inventions. So we thought that it followed that the federal lab researcher 
and their laboratory would have second rights to elect title to a joint invention. If both the contractor and the inventing agency waive title to the invention, it would then default to the funding agency, just like under the normal vital processes. So again, this change to 401.10 creates an explicit priority order for ownership of inventions jointly created between an extramural funding recipient and a non-funding agency. First, the contractor second, the inventing agency, and third, the funding agency. It does require the funding agency to notify the inventing agency if a contractor waives title to a joint invention. And this is because only the funding agency would have access to that invention's record in the iEdison system. It also requires the funding agency to provide administrative assistance, but not any financial assistance, to the inventing agency if the inventing agency decides to secure title to the invention. It also requires the inventing agency to consult with the funding agency on the management of the invention to ensure that the invention is managed in a way that is consistent with the original goals of the funding that resulted in the invention. Next, we've addressed the definition of initial patent applications in a couple of sections, 401.2, point 10, and point 14. First, we've included provisional applications as well as PCT applications and plant variety protection certificates in the de definition of initial patent application in 401.2. Additionally, we've permitted co-inventing agencies in the scenario that I just laid out to file initial patent applications in order to protect subject inventions. This could be a provisional application. The only caveat is that they should not be doing anything in that filing that would prevent the contractor from waiving rights. But they do have the ability to secure those rights if they know that there's an imminent disclosure. The next change I'll note is actually in 404, which deals with management and licensing of federally owned inventions. We've broadened the uh, notice requirements for announcing a prospective exclusive or co-exclusive license of a federal invention to be published in the Federal Register or other appropriate manner. So this could be an agency website, it could be a printed publication, or, or some other manner appropriate for announcing uh, information to the public. The guidance that we've received at NIST and want to make sure that you're aware of is that if your agency or lab does choose to use alternate means to announce exclusive licenses outside of the Federal Register, they do need to let the public know in, you guessed it, the Federal Register, where those alternate places are that they can find information about exclusive license notifications from that agency. And finally, we've streamlined the process for CRITA collaborators to access background inventions. An executed CRITA, which provides for the use for research and development purposes by the CRITA collaborator under that CRITA of a federally owned invention in the federal laboratory's custody, and which addresses the required information, and this is all laid out in 404.8, may be treated by the federal laboratory as an application for a license. So what this does is if you have a background invention in, uh, that's about to be used in a CRADA, um, at NIST and a couple of other agencies, um, you would have to, you as an extramural partner, would have to execute the CRADA and also execute a license for the research use of that stuff. And so what we've done is eliminated the license application in that scenario, provided that the CRADA collects uh, and displays all of the information that would normally be collected under a license application. And finally, just some other general changes that you might want to be aware of. As I mentioned previously, the new Vigil regulation codifies Executive Order 12591 to make the Vigil Act applicable to all businesses, regardless of size, large and small, and everything in between. Um, it complies with the American Events Act to create updates in the reporting timelines and definitions of statutory period. It requires contractors to have their employees explicitly assign rights to the contractor. This is a result of the Stanford v. Roche decision. It requires contractors to file non-provisional applications within 10 months of provisional filing. Contractors can request waivers, and to reduce the burden on agencies, we've stated that these will be automatically granted unless otherwise notified by the funding agency. 
It requires contractors to notify agencies 60 days before the end of the statutory period if a decision is made to not continue patent prosecution. This is an increase from the previous 30 days in the old Bidal rule. And it eliminates the time limit for an agency to request to elect title as a result of a contractor's failure to adhere to Bidal reporting requirements. Previously, if a contractor failed to disclose an invention or failed to elect title within the required timeline, an agency only had 60 days to request to elect title as a response of that noncompliance. Under the new Bidal rule, an agency can request title indefinitely um, any time after they become aware of a contractor's failure to either disclose an invention or to elect title to an invention in a timely manner. what are our next steps? First, we can finally move forward with the new publication of the FLC Green Book. If anyone doesn't already know, the FLC Green Book is the collection of relevant technology transfer legislation, regulation, and a few policies and executive orders. It's published by the Federal Laboratory Consortium and is a little bit overdue for republication. We had been holding the publication of the Green Book so that we could include the most up-to-date vital regulation that just came out. And now that that's published, we can move forward and get those copies out into your hands as soon as possible. Separately, under a separate initiative, uh, NIST and the National Institutes of Health will be undertaking an effort to rebuild the IFSN invention reporting system for extramural recipients beginning in FY19. Uh, we've already talked to some of the participating agencies to find out what their needs are for a new system, and we'll be going out to the public with a request for information in the next several months. We appreciate your help in uh, making sure that we get a good response to that. So if you could forward the link when you see it to your funding recipients and or your extramural colleagues, that would be greatly appreciated. Well, this effort to uh, update by dole regulation was not explicitly connected to the return on investment initiative that NIST has started up this year, or the uh, Unleashing American Innovation Symposium that took place on April 19. Uh, they certainly are interconnected. I've put the link to the NIST uh, ROI website up on the screen, and you can find out more information about that initiative. Uh, the request for information is currently out. Uh, the public forums that we are uh, in the process of holding, and uh, what our next steps will be from that stakeholder engagement process. So finally, I've listed out some of the resources. Um, under the Bidol regulation, you can look at the docket information, uh, the original notice of proposed rulemaking that was released in the Federal Register uh, back in November of 2016. Uh, you can see the regulations.gov docket information with all the public comments, and the final rule, which was published on April 13, 2018. Since I mentioned the personnel exchanges regulation as part of the Lab to Market initiative as well, um, the docket information for personnel exchanges, the NPRM publication, uh, and the final rule are also linked here. So finally, I want to thank all of you for attending this FLC webinar today to learn about the changes to uh, tech transfer regulations that might affect your office. My contact information is on the screen, and please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about the applicability of the changes in the VITAL rule or its implementation um, or anything to do with personal, personal exchanges or lab to market. Uh, I'll be turning now to the chat box to take your questions and answer them. All right, so moving over to some of the questions that have come in during uh, the slides. Um, there was a question about the priority order changes in 40110, aren't both the inventing agency and the funding agency the federal government? Uh, yes, that is true, um, but we do respect that there are differences in how agencies um, uh, m undertake patent management, and so this just provides an opportunity to very clearly lay out um, who's responsible um, at what point in the process, whether it's the inventing agency um, taking the lead on that patent prosecution um, because they have a co-inventor, um, or if they defer uh, to the funding agency as would be typical under um, 
a standard BIDOL situation, if you will. Um, a question came in on uh, how this will impact standard CRADA forms. Um, there should be no changes that come out of the BIDOL rule explicitly to the CRADA forms. Um, the only thing that we've changed in this regulation that touches on the CRADA aspect um, is that background license. Um, which would have been a separate document outside of the CRADA form anyways. So um, no changes should be needed to any standard CRADA forms at any agency. Uh, one question, how will the new tech transfer aspects help with biomedical tech transfer where multiple stakeholders are involved in the long development pipeline and regulatory hurdles have to be overcome? So this issue was not addressed in the BIDL rule update or the personnel exchange update, um, but it sounds like a great topic for the return on investment initiative. Um, we are taking a very broad look at tech transfer in that space, whereas this was very specifically um, looking at extramural reporting and extramural management of inventions that are funded by the federal government. Um, similarly, there was a question uh, about Wilbur Ross's news announcement uh, regarding tech transfer. Um, that is a very recent initiative, the Return on Investment Initiative. Um, as I pointed out earlier in the slides, the, the BIDL regulatory update timeline started uh, over two years ago um, and just coincidentally happened to uh, take effect the same week that we were rolling out the ROI initiative. Um, so I'm hopeful that, uh, that Secretary Ross's news announcement will result in actions. We're in the process of that stakeholder feedback process um, and uh, looking forward to the results of that down the road. Um, one question came in, how does this impact the Department of Defense tech transfer community, if at all? So both regulations, as I mentioned in the, um, in the slide presentation, are equally applicable to all agencies. Um, so DOD, you are in the same boat, uh, so to speak, as everyone else on this one. Um, question about how this new regulation will affect government contract terms. So government contract terms are found in the Federal Acquisition Regulation, or the FAR, um, and those are managed by a section of GSA. And we did coordinate um, throughout the process uh, of implementation with GSA. They will need to do an update to the FAR um, to have the provisions in the FAR match the provisions um, in the BIDOL rule. But there are actually a couple places where we took language from the FAR and incorporated it into the BIDOL regulation. A great example of this was that the FAR already required um, contractors to file uh, non-provisional applications within 10 months of filing provisional applications. And so we actually took that language verbatim and replicated it in 401.14 when we made the BIDOL updates. Um, a couple of other things like uh, the timelines and the requirement for contractors to assign uh, the rights to their inventions to their employer um, will need to be in the FAR update. And uh, once that language is updated, that'll be the standard language for government contracts. Um, somebody's very excited to get their new copy of the Green Book. Um, I believe that those should be available uh, sometime this fall, certainly in time for you to get your uh, physical copies at the next FLC meeting um, in, in April of 2019. Um, but before that, it will be available as a PDF online as soon as the updates are made by the uh, legal committee of the FLC Executive Board. So I'm sure there will be a big announcement uh, as soon as they're ready. We've been waiting for um, almost a year to get that Green Book update out, so uh, we will get it through as soon as we can. Um, there is a question about the slides being available. Um, this entire presentation has been recorded. It will be archived on the FLC website, so check for that um, in the next couple of days. Uh, one question about the new deck that we added in, uh, in 401.3. Uh, will the new deck be an option for all agencies to use? Uh, yes, uh, every agency um, has the ability to use that deck. Um, also asking about the deck, will the deck here replace existing agency decks or supplement the deck? 
So each agency who has a contractor deck has undergone uh, that review process to determine what the appropriate deck is for that particular contractor. Um, we would expect that uh, any agency using the new deck for service-based contractors that um, don't have a business model of commercializing inventions um, to also review and make a determination that that deck was the most appropriate deck for that particular contract. A uh, question came in about the co invention. If a contractor improperly notifies the co inventing agency of an invention, does the funding agency retain their right to reclaim title to the invention? What if the co inventing agency has proceeded to file a patent? Um, so if there, there was not a proper in, uh, invention report to the, the funding agency, um, that speaks to the change that we made um, in, what section is that? The change that we made um, which eliminated the 60-day deadline for agencies to claim title to inventions. Um, if, uh, a, if a contractor does not disclose. This is in 401.14.D1. So um, I, my assumption is that um, if it was a co-invention that was also not reported properly, then it would also um, be applicable to that change in 401.14 um, where a funding agency could retain their right to reclaim the title. Um, if the co-inventing agency has proceeded to file a patent at that point, um, we would expect the, the co-inventing agency and the funding agency to work in cooperation in that instance. Let's see. Question, um, when an awarding agency contracts with a university, and the university partners with another federal agency, what agreement is in place between the university and the federal partner? A CRADA, a sub-award, or a subcontract? Um, it, it, it probably would not be a sub-award or a subcontract to another federal agency, um, but it could be a CRADA, um, or it could be um, perhaps a cooperative agreement, um, but most likely a CRADA, uh, in that they would need to come to uh, Come access the expertise of um, of that federal agency. Another great example might be a user facility agreement. So if if uh, they came in to access a user facility um, and uh, worked with a scientist during that time, it, that could also result in um, in a co-invention. So I think I have gotten to all of the questions that came in so far. Um, if you have other questions, please feel free to pop those into the chat box now, um, and I'll continue to answer those as they come in. Also feel free to email me if you think of questions later, um, if you, you know, read the regulation and, and aren't sure about other things that I didn't address today um, because I tried to keep my comments and presentations focused on uh, things that were specifically impacting federal tech transfer offices. Um, but please feel free to reach out to me as well uh, if you think of something else. Okay, more questions coming in. Can parties agree to an arrangement for co-ownership that differs from the statute? Yes, we've explicitly said in 40110 that um, that the the provisions of that regulation uh, addressing co-ownership do not supersede um, any other institutional agreements. So, um, if the parties agree to manage the invention in a different way, um, then that is certainly acceptable. question about which change do you think will affect the day-to-day -day of a federal tech transfer officer the most? 
Um, at least at NIST, um, I know that uh, not having to uh, execute a separate license um, for a creative background invention will probably be the most impactful here. Um, I know that not every agency has that uh, requirement to do a separate license, but for the agencies that do, um, that should save quite a bit of time um, and effort on both the federal tech transfer professionals part as well as the collaborators part because they don't have to fill out two separate documents. Um, a question came in, can you elaborate on a user facility agreement? Uh, what authority? Um, hmm. I would have to look up the specific authority for user facilities. I don't have that available right in front of me. Um, but a user facility agreement is how outside uh, entities can access um, expertise and uh, facilities at uh, government agencies. Um, so for example, NIST has two user facilities. Um, we have a nanofab facility um, and a neutron research facility. And, and those are things that you know, you're, um, are not readily available to uh, the general public for their own uh, development and use. And so they can come to NIST under a user facility agreement and access those facilities for research projects. And I can get back um, uh, through the FLC on what the specific authority for that is. Who determines that the contractor cannot commercialize the technology? And does this exclude the contractor's ability to license out the technology? So again, we're looking at what, what we've uh, colloquially called service-based contractors. So these are, are not you know, researchers. These are um, contractors that provide often on-site services um, and are not able to take an invention through commercialization efforts because that's not their business model. Their business model is that they provide you know, on-site services. Um, we would expect that the, um, that the agency would make that determination. It is, of course, subject to, um, to review um, at the contractor's request, as all decks are. Um, if a contractor feels a deck has been applied improperly, they can certainly um, avail themselves of the uh, review process. Um, in that case, yes, it would exclude the contractor's ability to license out the technology because it's been determined that, um, that they are not able to commercialize it. Um, and therefore, the uh, government agency would have title to that. Um, just like any other DEC, uh, they could request greater rights for a specific invention if they could show that in that case, they would be able to license and commercialize that particular piece of technology. So all other DEC um, rules still apply in this instance. Okay. Other questions coming in? Um, plenty of time, uh, or feel free to reach out to me um, by email if you need more information. Was any consideration given to how the regulations apply to FFRDCs as an entity rather than the parent organization's legal status? So FFRDCs are subject to by dole um, uh, as they are contractors to the parent agencies um, and they would have uh, by dole regulations applied to them um, just like any other contractor. Okay, so my chat box window is empty. Um, really want to thank you all again for participating today. Feel free to reach out to me with additional questions. Um, if I can't answer them, I will forward them to our uh, wonderful legal counsel here at NIST. 
um, who will get you an answer to your question. Um, thanks again, and um, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day.